everyone, and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Jerusalem, Israel. We continue with Pirkei Dora Eliezer. Just so you guys know, I'm recording this on a Monday, and Monday is Yom Zikaron for uh, Yom Zikaron is the Memorial Day for the fallen soldiers and all those that have been killed in terror attacks. They go to the highest places in the heavens. Okay, anyone who gets killed or murdered because they are a Jew. Place, these are places that perfect tzaddikim cannot even go. And so we honor their memory of the fallen. And it's difficult because there's still a war that's happening right now. We have more and more fallen every single day. So this is especially a tough one. Going into Monday night and then Tuesday is Yom Atzmaut, likely when you're going to be getting this video. It's very strange going from like the saddest day as a nation to the happiest day, our celebrating our Independence Day. But... Um, Hey, I guess that's how that's how it's gonna be when God finally uh, re returns His presence to Zion. Hainu kecholmim. We're gonna see it, and we'll, we will be like dreamers. So, in other words, going from uh, from um, uh, how should we say fast days to feast days. In any case, happy seventy sixth to the state of Israel, for better or for worse. Anyway, let's get to it. We'll start with some Tehillim. הללו את אדוני כל גויים, שבחו כל האומים, כי גבר עלינו חסדו, ואמת אדוני לעולם, הללויה. So we are in chapter 45, this is 45a, new topic, we concluded with Amalek, although they are here. Um, this one is called The Golden Calf. The title is The Golden Calf, this one is called specifically Paved with Good Intentions. You know what comes before that. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, When the Holy One, blessed be he, was revealed to Moses from within the bush, he sent him to Egypt. Moses then said before the Holy One, blessed be he, Master of all the worlds, swear to me that you will do everything that I ask. In other words, if you're sending me into the lion's den, when I call upon you for help, that, you know, you got my back, right? So remember, God sent Moses to the most powerful man on earth to order him to let his people go. It's not so far-fetched that any one of us would ask for any kind of assurance. And we all know, if it wasn't for God's direct intervention, Moses would not have made it past the main gate. In other words, getting into the palace. We have plenty of Midrashim that say that Moses and Aaron pulled the same cards as Michael and Gabriel in Sodom. Genesis 19, 10, and 11. The men stretched forth their hands and they brought Lot to them to the house. And they shut the door. And the men who were at the entrance of the house, they struck with blindness. These are the angels, right? They stuck, struck them with blindness, both small and great. And they toiled in vain to find the entrance. Boom. Can't see. So, Moses, Aaron, they hit everyone and everything with blindness as they pass guard after guard, gate after gate. You couldn't just walk off the street and go to Pharaoh, right? We also know that Pharaoh had lions and other wild animals guarding all the ways to him as well. Everything is done by magic and incantations. And no person could get through unless they had an invitation. But Moses and Aaron bypassed them all. And then, poof. There they were, standing right in front of Pharaoh, who was probably wondering, how in the world did they just get here, right? They just kind of appeared. Moses continued and said, let me not tell Pharaoh something and it not come into fruition, lest he kill me. And when did we see this come into play? In Exodus 10, 28. Pharaoh said to him, go away from me, beware you shall no longer see my face, for on the day that you see my face... You shall die. So we have a direct death threat now from Pharaoh, right? We didn't get this up until this point, but now we have a direct death threat. I see you again, I'm going to kill you, okay? And we must know that at this point, he almost has nothing to lose. Almost, because we know that what comes next, right? This was after the darkness and before what? The firstborn, the, the smiting of the firstborns of Egypt. Which is why Moses invoked that promise that God made him when we read the following verse, verse 29. Thereupon Moses said, you have spoken correctly. <clears throat> you have spoken correctly, Pharaoh. I shall no longer see your face. 
You see, this is where you invoke that. This is the reason Moses did not return to inform Pharaoh of what was to come, because he would have killed him. Every single plague he came before that. Know that this is coming, that's coming. Oh, you're going to kill me next time? No problem. You won't see me anymore. Remember that. Okay. The Lord swore to Moses that the the Lord swore to Moses that everything he asks, God will grant, except for two things, meaning from that point until the end of his life. The first being entering the land of Israel. We know that didn't happen, and the second being his death day. As we know from the Pshat, Moses prayed 515 prayers, Va'it Hanan, Gimatria 515, prayers to God to enter the land of Israel when God told him to stop. As our commentators say that if Moses were to enter the land of Israel, he would have immediately built the temple and God would have placed his anger upon Israel and destroyed them all. This is the reason Moses backed down and stopped asking, right? It was all about Israel for Moses, just as he had placed his life on the line over the course of the 40 years in the wilderness. And as we've learned from Midrash Rabbah, Moses asked God that he may enter into the land maybe as a bird of the air, as a beast of the field, and that it was actually his own soul that did not want to leave his body. Why did Moses wish to enter into the land? Right? Just as a regular person, take away my leadership, take away everything. I just want to enter into the land. Why was it so important to him? What What is the Torah? It's called Torah Moshe, according to the word of God. It's called the Torah of Moses, right? Moses wanted to fulfill the commands of God. That's why he was, he was um, running to do everything, just like Abraham. They were hasty in doing the Lord's work. So why? So he could fulfill all the commandments of the Torah, which many of them are dependent upon being inside the land of Israel and most of them regarding the temple. We have 613 commandments, right, in the Torah. 613 commandments can be found in the five books of Moses. They are all broken down into categories. How many of those commands do you think we have today that we can actually fulfill today? Maybe over 100? You understand? All the other commands have to do with the land of Israel and the temple in the land of Israel. So right now, if you were a Jew living outside the land of Israel, don't even talk to me. We got to get here so we can learn what to do when it needs to be done. So there would be no doubt that the man that God called his most faithful servant in all his house would make a beeline to Temple Mount, destroy any and all nations in his path, taking talking about full scorched earth over here and building the temple just as he did the Mishkan. Moses built the Mishkan. We think it's a problem for him to build the temple. Everybody put uh, uh, brought in the things for the Mishkan and they put it, uh, they, they gave Moses all the variables, all the pieces, but they could not erect it themselves. Moses did the whole thing by himself every single day for seven days, as we learned in uh, going up to Parshat Shmini. On the eighth day, that's where the dedication ceremony took place, and that was on the first of Nisan. So it would not be a problem. Again, we're not talking, but there's no logic here, right? This is biblical. Moses could easily build it, could have built the temple himself, but he says, if I do this, Israel is going to die, then I'm done. All right. So if that were to happen, Likely Moses would not die, but Israel would, because they have not yet been refined as Moses was. They were nowhere near Moses' level. And the judgments that would fall upon the world would wipe out Israel as well, thereby undoing God's oath to Abraham back in Genesis 22, 16 to 18, after the binding of Isaac. And he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, Right? Because you have done this thing and you did not withhold your son, your only one, that I will surely bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your descendants will inherit the cities of their enemies. And through your children shall be blessed all the nations of the world because you hearken to my voice. If Abraham's seed was to end because Moses entered the land of Israel, then it's all over, right? Then this could really not be. First of all, God's word would end. That that could never be. So you see why this had to happen. And from where do we know that God swore? 
Genesis 22, 16. As he said by myself, I have sworn. Vayomil bini shbati neum Adonai. When Israel received the Ten Commandments, after 40 days, they forgot their God, says Perkidur of Eliezer. This we can read in Psalms 106. We're going to go from 19 to 22. They made a calf in Horeb and uh, prostrated themselves to a molten image. They exchanged their glory for the likeness of an ox eating grass. And the ox actually did it. Grass. They forgot God, their Savior, who wrought great deeds in Egypt, wonders in the land of Ham, awesome deeds by the Sea of Reeds. Where's the land of Ham? That's Africa, right? Africa is the entire domain of Ham. Sea of Reeds, Yam Suf. It's all in Psalms 106. Then they told Aaron, the Egyptians would carry or lift their gods, and they would sing and dance before them as they saw it before them, right? They came to Aaron and said, listen, this is how the Egyptians handled their gods. We want, we want what they had over there. Behold the difference between our faith and other idolatrous beliefs. Exodus 20, 19 to 20. The Lord said to Moses, you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that from the heavens I have spoken with you. In other words, you didn't see any kind of image, right? You shall not make images of anything that is with me. Gods of silver or gold, you shall not make for yourselves. In other words, you didn't see anything. There is no image of God. When I ask you today, when you think of God, what is the image of God? Close your eyes, okay? You should be like, I don't know, everything, nothing, yes, but there is no one image of God, okay? Meaning, you want to limit God to an image, right? All of reality, can you imagine all of reality? You might not even, uh, you likely don't know what it is that you don't know, right? I know what I know. Do I know everything that I don't know? No, because new things come to light every day, right? So how could you possibly... If God is everything in all of reality, which he created, not to mention beyond that, we cannot comprehend. So if you're thinking really, okay, so what is the image of God? There's nothing. There is no image. You have not seen anything through the clouds, through mist. I got nothing. That's where you go. If you see, God forbid, anything else in there, you got to work on that. What? You need a figure to worship, right? You need a statue that you built or a man that you invented. It's easier, of course, isn't it? To focus on that, to concentrate on something or someone. You can also see a major difference, even according to how we study, to how they study. One dimensional compared to infinity. It's, it's so simple. Look at how many layers there are in a single verse that we read in Hebrew. You could spend a lifetime and not even begin to scratch the surface of just one verse in the Torah. But then again, I guess a religion where everyone is a prophet and everyone hears directly from their God, despite that they all contradict one another, yes, is appealing. That's all they know. I, I feel sorry almost. So then, like today, they sing and dance. And hey, there's nothing better that can get a physical and emotional response from a person. It's when you sing and dance, it releases endorphins. That's why people feel all spiritual when they go. So I get it. But really, that's all it is. That's as deep as it goes. Exodus 32.1. When the people saw that Moses was late, Boshesh Moshe, right? In coming down from the mountain, the people gathered against Aaron and they said to him, come on, make us gods that will go before us, right? Give us something tangible, something we can see and touch easier. What, what did they do? They went to Moses. They went to, before Moses' companions to Aaron and Hur, his nephew. And from where do we know that Hur was the son of his sister, Miriam, right? First Chronicles 2.19. And Azuvah died, and Caleb took to himself Ephrat, and she bore him Hur. What? And look what it says in the next verse. And Hur begot Uri, and Uri begot Betzalel, right? The same one to build the Mishkan. So a few questions. Why were they called Moses' companions? For two reasons. One, he left them in charge when he was receiving the Torah. 
And two, they prayed with him on top of the peak as Israel were fighting Amalek, right? Aaron was holding one arm and Hur was holding the other while Joshua was uh, uh, conducting the battle. And another question is Ephrat, right? Let's read that verse again. And Azuvah died and Caleb took to himself Ephrat and she bore him Hul, right? So who is Ephrat? So we know, we know who Hur is. We know this is referring to Miriam, but why does it say Ephrat? Okay, that's a question. So this is what our text says as well. And why was Miriam called Ephrat? Because she was a daughter of the palace, a daughter of kings, one of the magnates of the generation. Who was Miriam's father? Amram, who he was Gadol Hadol, the great leader of the generation, as well as the head of the Sanhedrin. Amazing. Quite literally, she was the daughter of a king. She came from a royal family, right? Her brother Moses, then he became the king, the leader of Israel. Aaron became the high priest. Her brother Moses became king. Aaron became the high priest. And every prince and great man who arose in Israel, check this out, had his name called an Ephrat. As said in 1 Kings 11.26, And Jeroboam, the son of Navat, an Ephraimite, right? Ephrati. It says Ephraimite, but it's not Ephraimite as in from Ephraim. Benavat Ephrati of Zerada, whose mother's name was Tzerua, a widow. He was Solomon's servant. He raised his hand against the king. Now we learned all about Yeravam and how he's a precursor for Christianity because he brought in all the idolatry and he changed the times and he he took the he didn't let Israel go up to the temple and so on and so forth. Watch uh, in the class of uh, Mashiach ben Yosef, right? He's one of the worst people in the history of Israel, and he was also a precursor to the exile of the ten tribes and the whole concept of Jebus. That that's this guy. So he was from the tribe of Ephraim ben Yosef, as Mashiach ben Yosef must come from that tribe. So we discuss this in great detail in the Red Series, right? Calling all sparks, the secret of Mashiach ben Yosef. If you didn't watch it, then, you know, please go watch it. So we see an uh, Ephrati in one, in one aspect over there, right? As far as he goes. Now, what does it say in 1 Samuel 17, 12? And David was the son of an Ephratite, properly, with David ben Ish Ephrati, Hazeh, this man from Bethlehem of Judah, whose name was Jesse, Ishai, and he had eight sons, and the man was old in Saul's time coming among them. So it's written down to show us that although there is a place called Ephrat, I got family that live over there, that's right down over yonder. It's a town that's about 20 minutes south of our current location, around Kiryat Arba, Hebron. The name Ephrati was given to us by Pierre K. de Rabbi Eliezer to show us that it, in fact, is a title as well. A title of what specifically? As we read earlier concerning Miriam, the daughter of kings and magnates of the generation. And so David, from the line of David, and Yeravam, from the line of Ephraim, from the line of Joseph, their lineage was and will be that of kings and messiahs. So, was he from Ephrat? asks Pirkei Derbe Eliezer. But rather, he was from the tribe of Judah. And he was the son of kings and magnates of the generation. Remember Jacob's blessing to Judah? Genesis 49. Let's, read, let's start from uh, verse 8, 8 through 10. Judah, as for you, your brothers will acknowledge you. Your hand will be at the nape of the nepo, uh, the nape of your enemies the back of their necks, and your father's sons, meaning your brothers, will prostrate themselves to you. A cub and a grown lion is Judah. From the prey, my son, you withdrew. He crouched, rested like a lion, and like a lion who will rouse him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the student of the law from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him will be a gathering of peoples. Who Shiloh? Shiloh is Gimatria Moshe, until Moses comes, the student of the law. Moses brought the law until Moses comes back and starts reteaching the law, the Torah, properly. So that's the role of Judah, right? Judah is the, the one that carries the scepter. 
And since Hur, we're back in our text, since Hur came from Judah, he too was one of the magnates of the generation. So this, the, the uh, royalty of the line of Judah already started way back when, as he began to reproof and, rebu and rebuke Israel. Difficult things. It says, Dvarim Kashim, difficult things he spoke to them, right? What do you think he said to those who were swayed by the heir of Rav to make them an idol? I mean, he was livid, furious. Are you insane? We heard from the mouth of God that I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall not have other gods before me. Immediately followed by, you shall not make for yourself a, gra a graven image or any likeness which is in the heavens above, which is on the earth below, or which is in the water beneath the earth. Nothing. No fish either. You shall neither prostrate yourself before them nor worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a zealous God who visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the sons up until the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Have you lost your mind, people? Or perhaps your memory? It was but 40 days ago that Moses ascended to receive the Torah. Can't be heat stroke, right? We're, we're covered with clouds. Can't be lack of water. Or did you forget what happened at Masa and Meribah? Wink, Amalek. Get it? So what is it? Oh, it's these guys, the fakers among us, the posers. They're obviously leading you astray. Exodus 32, 1. The people gathered against Aaron, it says. Where's Hur? Why against Aaron? Because at this point, they already murdered his nephew Hur right in front of him when he let him have it. As our text says, And the despicable ones that were within Israel stood over him and killed him. And by the way, Midrash Tanchuma, it also says that uh, they killed the 70 elders of Israel at that time. And Aaron saw Hur, that he was murdered, and he built an altar, as said in, Genesis, in uh, Exodus 32, 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it, and Aaron proclaimed and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. What did he see? That Hur, his nephew, was murdered. Now, let's break down the psychological implications of what's going on, okay? We know that Aaron transgressed, right? We know this. This is one of the three commandments in the Torah that is called Yehareg Ubaal Yavol, to be killed but not to transgress, right? It's idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder. If someone says, go bow down to an idol, go say that this idol is God or this man or whatever, or we will kill you, you choose death. If someone says, if you don't kill that person, I will kill you, you choose death. If someone says, go do any sexual immoral act, even if it is to be in unity with your own wife during the off periods, in other words, while she is ritually impure, you choose death. That's how serious that thing is. So these are one of the three things that we know in the Torah that you, if you... If you get to that point, you have to choose death before transgressing one of these three. These three are also what Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov did a tikkun for Adam for, because he was also guilty of these three. And these three were the same three sins, transgressions, that caused the destruction of the first temple. So, however, the Torah hadn't been given yet. And though the, though the damage had been done, so in other words, there was not that prohibition just yet, Obviously, he knew that it was wrong. But again, we're going into, into Aaron's psyche over here. Aaron would have been happy to rebuke them. What are you guys nuts? What's going on? You, what, did you forget, right? You're like, you want to shake a person. Like, what do you mean, build us a golden idol? What? You witnessed everything that happened over the last year to Egypt, the, the, the Sea of, of Reeds, Mount Sinai, what do you mean you want an idol? That it, it wasn't Israel, like we said, all right? So he would have happily rebuked them just like Hor did. But to that end, he already knew the result. It wasn't that he wanted to save himself. He wanted to save Israel, right? He said, so if I rebuke them, I know exactly how this is going to end, right? And he too would have been killed 
and they would have gotten somebody else to make them an idol. They just would have kept on going. One way or another, this would have happened. Okay? So he tried another method because the point uh, because the point was to delay them until Moses returned. He knew that Moses was coming back on this day, but they took full advantage that he wasn't just there yet. Again, this is also a hint as to what is to come. Even if it seems like, well, if Messiah doesn't come now, right? Or if God doesn't intervene now, if this, that, that, and now, then we are done for. It's very well could be that that's not going to happen when we expect it. In fact, Messiah, it, the coming of Messiah, of Mashiach, it says that happens when you least expect it. When you are distracted. Oh, here it is. No. When everyone is distracted. When you actually, literally least expect it. Okay, so his point here was to delay. So let's see what our text says. And Aaron judged within himself, meaning he was thinking, okay, how do I do this? What's, what's going on right now? He said to himself, if I tell them to give me silver and gold, they'll bring it right away. Again, if you're over there, you, you don't like what somebody said, you killed him. Okay, so we got to go, we got to go, we got to go. So remember, we discussed the pull of idolatry in the world at that time, up until our sages weakened it during the time of the Second Temple. It was like, um, it was like crack, okay? Crack on top of white processed sugar and just putting a bunch of steroids over there. Listen to the teaching we did a couple of months ago called, uh, titled King Manasseh, okay? King Manasseh. He describes the pull back then. It's unimaginably strong and relentless. He says that if you were allowed, you want to judge me? He came to one of the sages in a, in a dream, right? And he says, you want to judge me that I chased after idolatry? If you, great sage, great holy man, if you were alive during my time, you would have lifted up your skirt and you would have run to places of, of idol worship. That's how strong it was, okay? Unimaginable pull. We can't imagine it because it's not that strong today, yet people are still into it, but still. Okay, so this, of course, is understandable since it is a prohibition in the third of the Ten Commandments. In other words, if something isn't a problem, you usually don't have to, if there's no pull to there, you don't have to say, don't do it, right? Hey, thou shall not murder. There's a difference between thou shall not kill, but thou shall not murder. Why? Well, this person did me wrong, so I'm just going to go kill him. You don't want to build me an idol? Boom, there you go. Death. There's a reason we have these commands, and there's a reason that this one is number three. And since God's presence, the Shekhinah, was so prevalent in the world at that time, there had to be something to counterbalance it, right? As all things have to be perfectly balanced. Aaron continues, But rather, I will tell them to give me your earrings, right? Give me your earrings and those of your sons, uh, give me your wife's earrings and those of your sons and daughters, and immediately the request would be dropped, right? Go get them from your from your wives. As said in Exodus 32 too, and Aaron said to them, remove the golden earrings that you uh, that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring those earrings to me. Meaning they would see that this wasn't going to happen because go ahead, make your woman part with their jewelry and... Uh, that's it. No more idol. The matter is closed. Well, we tried, guys. All right, next time. But here's the thing, all right? Though the men were from the heir of Rav, their wives were actually Israel. And Aaron, no, Aaron knew Hebrew women. He was surrounded by them. He was raised by them. His mother, Yocheved, was 210 years old with no signs of slowing down and the most righteous woman of her generation. His older sister Miriam was a righteous prophetess since she was three years old, and she led all the women. Both together were responsible for saving the male children of Israel. Aaron's wife, Elisheva, another righteous woman in her own right from the tribe of Judah, who bore him four righteous sons and raised them well. These were the Israeli women that Aaron counted on. No way, okay? Do you think for a moment that these women would have a problem to part with their silver and their gold for a good cause? Look what Israel did when they gave 
when they gave to the building of the Mishkan. Men and women alike, they couldn't give fast enough. They had to be stopped. Exodus 35, 22. The men came with the women. Every generous hearted person brought bracelets and earrings and rings and buckles and buckles and kinds of gold objects. And every man who waved a waving of gold to the Lord, every, they gave, gave. What, you think it's a problem? Now, with that in mind, this is what Aaron was thinking about, right? Let's continue. And the women heard this and they disagreed and refused to give their earrings to their husbands. But they told them to their husbands, you want this? You want our gold? And you want our gold, really? To make a detestable and an abominable thing without any power to deliver? We will not listen to you. That is a Hebrew woman. Not because, oh no, you're not taking my jewelry. No, it had nothing to do with that. This is one of those slow clap moments. Exactly. In Yalkut Shimoni it says, Rabbi Akiva says, Bizchut nashim tzadkaniot yatsu Yisrael mimitzrayim. By the merit of righteous women, Israel left Egypt. And we're not only speaking of Yocheved and Miriam here, though they led the charge, but all the women of Israel. We know that there was only one unrighteous woman of Israel, and that was the wife of Datan, one of the two instigators that caused the, all those problems up until including the Korach rebellion. She was the only harlot in Israel, and she was cheating on her husband with an Egyptian. And we're going to see it later on in the book of Leviticus. And there was... A man, the son of the Egyptian and an Israeli woman who was cursing God. That was the bastard son. Another one. And we're not only speaking, like we said, of Yocheved and Miriam, but all the women of Israel. If it wasn't for their tenacity, there would be no Israel. When the men were laboring in the field back in Egypt, they had no energy even to make it home, let alone procreate with their wives, continuing the lineage so what did the women do? They dressed to the nines, and each woman went to the field and found her husband, and though and through that they guaranteed the continuity of our people. They said, I know you're tired, honey, but here I am. And that's what went down. And now here you think that these women would give anything towards these abominations? These were holy, righteous women, not the women of Israel, okay? Those are our women. As a result, not only were we taken out of Egypt by the merit of righteous women, but our sages continue to say, and by the merit of righteous women, Israel will be redeemed. By the merit of righteous women. Like we said, there's the prophecy of the Ben Ishchai. It it's like a Ruch HaKadosh understanding. 150 years ago. See, men do have the power. Yes. But who controls that power? Women. This goes from Eve controlling Adam. We already saw that, right? And what happened as a result. And it continues till this very day. That's why it is so important that our women remain holy, because if they are not, Israel falls as a result. Like we said, Ben Ishchai said this 150 years ago. His student, Ben Ishchai was um, this guy, right? I showed you this book before. Is that guy. That's a Ben Ishchai from Iraq. So, uh, his students asked him, like I said, I heard this story from the grandson of one of his students who heard him saying this. They came to him and they said, Rabbi, give us uh, some signs before the coming of Mashiach. He says, read Masechet Sanhedrin, read Masechet Sotah. It says exactly what's going to happen for it. No, 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 give us something extra. He said, okay, fine. When the daughters of Israel walk in the land of Israel half naked. What? First of all, it would never occur. You, It would never come into anybody's mind that a Jewish girl would walk around half naked anywhere in the land of Israel. There was no land of Israel then, right? It was during the Ottoman Empire and they were sitting in Iraq at the time. So what land of Israel and a daughter of Israel walking around half naked in the street? All, a lot of them? Impossible. And then he said, and as a result, the sons of Israel, the young men will die. What's up, right? Now, what's up? And this is come to Israel. It's a very sad thing, okay, to see the daughters of the king of the universe walking around half naked. 
not only in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem too. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And as a result, the young men of Israel will die. Okay, anyway, so bottom line is women actually can control this. But by the matter of righteous women, Israel will be redeemed, which means they got to do tshuva. At some point, they might start to realize, cover themselves up. You want us to make this detestable and abominable thing without any power to deliver? We will not listen to you, said the women of Israel. And the Holy One, blessed be he, gave them their reward in this world because they keep the heads uh, because they keep the heads of the month, Rosh Chodesh, more so than the men. And guess what, kids? Rosh Chodesh is a holiday for the women of Israel, right? They must not do any work whatsoever, but only relax and enjoy themselves. And, you know, the men can follow suit, right? Sometimes if you have to go work on Rosh Chodesh, you go work. But the women, no, no, relax, nothing. Rosh Chodesh, as we know, is a very high time. We say Hallel, we read the Torah, we say Musaf. Rosh Chodesh is like a small Yom Kippur due to its holiness of the day. And there's a special gate that opens up in heaven. This is the day to pray, to learn Torah, to ask, more so than other days. It's an auspicious time. This is also the day to have a feast with meat and wine. But that's not all that God granted to the women of Israel. And the Holy and Blessed Be He gave them their rewards in the world to come as well, as they will become renewed just like the renewal of the months. As said in Psalms 103.5, who sates your mouth with, with goodness, that your youth renews itself like the eagle. This renewal has everything to do with the fallen state of man, male and female. Adam is male and female and by extension, all of creation. All the curses of Eve will be undone just as Adam's will be. In fact, this alludes to the fourth day of creation, when God created the great luminaries. As we have learned in the three teachings uh, from Pirkei Der Eliezer, creation, the fourth day, the way of the sun, the way of the moon, and the immaculate conception real one, right? Feel free to go watch those and to delve deep into this concept. But what is to come is what is spoken of in Isaiah 30, 26. And the light of the moon shall be like the light of the sun, right? Because right now we know what happened over there. The sun and the moon were the same size and they gave the same amount of light. The moon said, how can two kings share a single crown? So God said to the moon, diminish yourself. And right, so now the moon is exponentially smaller than the sun, and it has no light of its own. In fact, it only has the light that the sun gives to it, right? It always pays to be humble. And now the moon has been humbled since creation. And you think this isn't going to come back? Look, and the light of the moon shall be like the light of the sun. In other words, it's going to return to the, they're going to return. The two are going to be the same size now. And the light of the sun, meaning also with the light of the moon, shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. On the day the Lord shall bind the fracture of his people and the stroke of their wound he shall heal. The sun is male, the moon is female, but Israel as a people are also likened to the moon. We go according to the lunar calendar as well. So you see, everything when it comes to Israel is both personal and collective. That's how we roll, because God made it so. Let's continue. And the men saw that the women did not listen to them to give their earrings to their husbands. So what did they do? Until that hour, their earrings were in their ears as the Egyptians and as the Arabs, it says. Uh, Arabs, right? There is, of course, a distinction made here between the Egyptians and the Arabs because they are not the same people. Like we said, ancient Egyptians are from the line of Ham. They were black. Ham was black as night, it said while the Arabs from the, are from the line of Shem, right? Shem, Ham, and Yefet. Ham, Ham, right? The Arabs come from the line of Shem. Olive skin, your average Middle Eastern look. And we also know that they existed at the same time, intermingling with one another, as Egypt was the melting pot of the world at that time. But even in the story of Joseph, we saw the Midianites, the Ishmaelites, going to, coming from, right? Okay. So this concept of men wearing earrings 
came from Egypt. And as we have learned, anything coming from the filth of Egypt is idolatrous by nature. So again, when you're thinking Egypt today, Egypt is an Arab country. But they have the Arabs, the Muslims have nothing to... Ancient Egypt was not a Muslim country. Islam was only invented about a thousand years, oh, 1200 years ago, something like that, right? Took after Christianity. This concept of men wearing earrings, like we said, it came from Egypt. And it was also the idolatry capital, capital of the world, Egypt was. Just as nine-tenths of the world's beauty was given to Jerusalem, nine-tenths of the world's impurity was found in Egypt. We can see this um, uh, in uh, we can see this stance in Judges 8:24. And Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you that you give me every man the nose rings of his spoil, for they had golden nose rings because they were. Ishmaelites. Who are Ishmaelites? These are Arabs, right? Now, it's interesting because it says in Hebrew, it's nezim. The word here for earrings in Exodus and nose rings over here in Judges is the same word. It's nezim. In modern day Hebrew, nezim, yeah, it, it means a nose ring. An earring is called agil. But here, in biblically speaking, it's nezim, what we call nose rings. Back then, it was, it was earrings, all right? And it, why is it called agil from agol? I guess they have the hoops, right? Um, anyway, the point is, though, whether the rings were in their ears or in their noses, these were not the ways of Israel. And that is even more proof that the transgressors of the golden calf were, in fact, Erev Rav, right? Because Israeli men did not wear earrings. So what did the men do? They tore out their rings that were in their ears and gave them to Aaron, as said in Exodus 32.3. And all the people stripped themselves of the golden earrings that were on their ears and brought them to Aaron. It does not say that were in their wives' ears, but rather it says that were in their ears. And we know the story of how they handled the handed the pile to Aaron, which is what transferred the impurity and drawing from Aaron's holiness to be able to create anything. And among the earrings, Aaron found a golden plate, uh, seats like the um, like the high priest would wear. It's like a golden band, like a um, very thin layer of gold, and in it was engraved God's name. Right. So we'll just call it a golden plate over here. I don't know. Aaron found a golden plate with the holy name of God written on it and engraved on it was the shape of a calf. From the Midrash, we've learned that this golden plate is what Moses used to raise Joseph's lead coffin out of the River Nile, as Joseph is represented by the ox, on the, which is on the left side of the Merkava, right? And the left side, as we know, is judgment. We also... and. Gold is synonymous with judgment on the left. Silver is mercy on the right. So we also know, like we said, uh, gold and silver. The same plate, that same plate, is what Micha, not the prophet Micha, but the idolater born of Israel from the root of the heir of Rav, that Moses saved, not exactly knowing what would come of him. We've discussed this before. All of the children that were thrown into the Nile and died Though they were from Israel, their souls, their the root of their creation was from the heir of Rav. And Moses wanted to take pity on them. And he told God, please save your children. God said, you really think I'm going to let my kids just go, especially before they're y'all are about to be redeemed? No. Moses said, give me one. God said, it's not going to work out for you. Moses said, please. God said, okay, here you go. And the one that he saved became Micha who also likely gave this uh, this golden plate to Aaron, right? And later on, he crossed the sea with them. Later on, he went into the land of Israel and he built a temple. And like we discussed, it was Moses' own son, uh, Nachshon, uh, Menashe, Menashe, excuse me, Menashe, who became a priest in this idolatrous temple. And it's, uh, it's interesting because it says, uh, and there was a man from uh, a Levite man, uh, for, uh, for the son of Menashe, whose father's name was Menashe. But if you look at Menashe, the way it's written, it has a hanging upside down nun. If you remove the letter nun from the name Menashe, you get 
Moshe. In other words, they put the Nun in there to, for, to, to save face for Moses. In other words, this is what your son, what happened to your son. But like we said, Moses even told his own kids, you cannot be part of Israel. Why? Because you didn't go through what they went through. You didn't struggle and suffer like they did. That's why we're talking about a conversion process. If you want to join Israel, you got to go through it because that's what our life is basically like. Look at us in the world right now. We're not we're not anybody's favorite people, and we all know it's going to get worse. It has to. We want it to get worse so we can get the ball rolling already. All right? So that's what that is. So people will say, oh, I identify as Israel and a Jew. No, you don't. It didn't work for Moses, kids. It's not going to work for you. Okay, so... Like we said, this is the same player of the, of the uh, idolatrous uh, Micha, known as Peser Micha. He had, he had an idol. And this plate alone did Aaron throw into the fire. In other words, they gave him a pile of, of uh, golden earrings, and there was the golden plate over there with God's name on it and a picture of an ox. Right? As said in Exodus 32, 24, I said to him, who has gold? So they took it, the gold, off and gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf, right? We can even see this from the text itself that Aaron did everything in his power and understanding to avoid granting their requests. And it's even from the simple text right here. We could break this down. How do we melt gold today? I googled this. How do we melt gold today? Okay. To melt gold, an extremely high temperature is required. Gold has a melting point of 1,064 degrees Celsius or 1,947 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. In other places I found it actually has, it has to be 3,000 degrees Celsius and in other places upwards of 5,000 degrees Celsius. Your average temperature of a large bonfire, a large bonfire burning for a while can eventually and gradually reach degrees of 1,000 degrees, reach degrees of, reach 1,000 degrees Celsius, but the average is 600, no way near boiling point for gold, right? None of which is relevant because regarding the melting of gold, it says, achieving such a rapid melting process would likely require a specialized and controlled environment, such as using advanced industrial equipment like induction furnaces or lasers that can reach temperatures far above the gold's melting point. In other words, it even has to be hotter than that, right? But Aaron threw the plate into the fire. It didn't even say into the furnace. We have Tanurim. We see a furnace. Uh, that's where they threw Abraham in. And then later on in the covenant of the pieces. And behold, a furnace burning with fire. So we have the concept of Tanu. Tanu is a furnace. If it said, and Aaron put it in the furnace, okay. But he threw the plate into the fire, into a bonfire. What are you going to get from that, right? It does not say Aaron threw them, the earrings, into the fire, but rather it says he threw it. Va'ashlichehu. Not va'ashlichem. Va'ashlichehu. Singular. There is one thing that he threw into the fire, referring to the plate. When Aaron received all this pile of gold along with the plate, he saw that he saw maybe I have an opportunity right here. First of all, he saw God's explicit name upon the plate to which he believed would cancel any plans the idolaters might have. Second, he discarded the majority of the gold, thereby not leaving enough to build anything of significance. Third, he knew that the plate was uh, he knew what the plate was and where it came from, and that it was created for holy purposes to bring the co the coffin of Joseph. Um, and this was his focus. Right on the holy ox of the left side of Merkava. So it's like, okay, we got God's name, we got an ox, holy ox, let's go. None of this is happening. And last, he just tossed the thing into the fire, never expecting anything to come out of it, but it did. And so, if you look at what Aaron did, he had every reason to be as surprised as any of us from what came out next. He didn't fashion this golden calf, right? If you ask the question, how could Aaron have thrown the holy name of God into the fire, thereby destroying it, the answer is simple, right? Once filth and impurities have been mixed in with something holy, 
even, even intent, and we know that there were incantations over there, everything becomes impure and unholy. Not that God's name can ever be pure or unholy, but the use of it, right? The use of it for unsanctioned purposes, thereby making it unkosher, if you will. Okay? See uh, chametz for Pesach, right? Everywhere where there's chametz, everything is ruined. You have to remove that. Or see the New Testament in Hebrew, for instance, right? If it has God's name in there, let's say you got a Hebrew uh, Hebrew uh, uh, New Testament, and you got and it's written Hebrew, right? You are obligated to either burn the whole thing, even if it's connected to what they call the Old Testament, you know, the one that's irrelevant. You have to either burn it or bury it or just th straight up throw it away, throw it into the garbage. Why? Because of the source where it came from. And you need to know Hebrew very, very well to see the discrepancies or the translations, but how the original Hebrew has been altered throughout to fit the idolatrous Edomite agenda within our holy scriptures. So the whole thing, the whole thing is Tamet, impure. And that's also why easily you can see how the Messianics are part of the Erev Rav of our generation as they quite literally, what is Erev Rav? Mix, to mix, to confuse. They quite literally take that which is holy and make it unholy by infusing the text, our text, the holy text with their garbage agenda putting it all together. What's real, what's not? Oh, no, look, this is the Old Testament. It's no problem. No, it's not. And it's a very big problem. They are more like the Egyptians than anything else. Lamb God, for goodness sakes. It's so painfully obvious, like we said. But, you know, we could continue to joke about this. When the calf came out of the fire, surprising everyone, except for the heir of Rav, whose incantations and piggybacking off the holiness produced this abominable thing. What else? What other piggybacking have they done to produce other abominable idols? When it came out, it moaned and mooed as cows do. And as a result, and how does our text conclude? And Israel saw it and were led astray after it because, hey, maybe it is impressive. And why? Because one of Israel's esteemed leader's name was stamped all over it. If any, if any guy would have done it, then, okay, what's well, a big deal? But boy, they got a guy with the title of what? Title of Aaron. And who was Aaron? He was a leader. If Aaron did this, then I guess it must be okay, right? Wrong. You can liken this to fools who give themselves today the title of rabbi, but they are not. And, what, and when they're anything but, and they cause Israel to be led astray after them, whether they are Messianic or whether they are even Orthodox. I've seen plenty, plenty of corrupt, crooked rabbis, okay, who, and good people follow. What did the rabbi say? What did the rabbi say? Read for yourself what needs to be done. Whenever I ask a rabbi a question, I said, rabbi, what do I do in this in this case? This is how the rabbi needs to answer you. The halacha says A, B, and C, right? They will say, the, you want to know because he's supposed to be an expert in that field. If this and this and this situation, how do I conduct myself? Well, it says that this and this and this and that and this and this and that. So when he gives you the answer, you understand its source, you understand its logic, and you understand what to do even without him spelling it out for you. That is what a good rabbi does, right? But rabbis just say, do what I say. When it comes to halacha, your soul depends on it. You can't just say, sure, and follow blindly. They have to explain it to you. That is what a good rabbi does. Okay? So like we said, follow anybody with the title of rabbi, and, um, you know, after the idols they make for themselves, and that's it. We were warned not to do so. Right? Why? Because this is what the nations do. We don't do what the nations do. And if the nations are doing anything that we are doing, then we have canceled it by default. Once upon a time, we used to play musical instruments on Shabbat. Now, because the Messianics and the Christians do it, we do not do it. You are not allowed to do this because they're doing it. They're taking holy and they're making it unholy. And so if we do it, then all of a sudden we're like them. You see, that's how far we have to separate, even if it means foregoing certain things that were done way back when. Everything's going to change. Don't worry. All right. So. 
We were warned not to do as the nations do. We do not take their women. We do not take their customs. We do not take their names. We do not take their style of dress. We do not take their gods. We were told to separate ourselves for our own sakes. We were told to be holy for the Lord our God is holy. Parashat Kedushim, the Parsha that we just read on Shabbat. Look at this. You are not going to be like the rest of the nations. But I'll tell you what. All the things that we discuss, and especially right now in the book of Leviticus, we know nobody else follows it, only Israel. Well, ideally, right? And the moment that we allowed anything or anyone foreign inside without conforming fully to our ways, no matter how small or insignificant the act may have been, the end result are always de uh, detrimental and catastrophic to us as individuals and as a nation. It's just like one little thing. What's the big deal? It's, it's, a, it's a very, very slippery slope. Case in point, look at us today. Look at us in Europe 80 years ago. Look at us in, during the times of the Inquisition 500 years ago. Look at us before the destruction of the Second Temple. During the Persian exile, the story of Purim, right? The, all the times that we fell because we allowed foreign stuff in. Before the destruction of the first temple, how we lost our way and emulated the nations. During the days of the judges, after we entered into the land of Israel. And look at what led to the events of the golden calf. But when we are united as a holy and separate nation before God, as he told us to be. It was said of us by the most unholy, impure, and abominable sorcerer who could destroy armies with a single word. Who is this? This is Bilam. What did he say? Numbers 24, 5. How goodly are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. And when we live according to the way that God instructed us to live, when we do what we as Israel are supposed to do, as portrayed to us according to his faithful servant Moses, not for God's own sake, but for our own sake, that's when we can turn the earth into heaven. This day I call upon the heaven and the earth as witnesses that I have warned you, I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. You shall choose life so that you and your offspring will live, not only in this world, but in the world to come. To love the Lord your God, to listen to his voice and to cleave to him, for that is your life and the strength of your days. That is why you breathe air. To dwell on the land, Israel. Why are Jews not in Israel? Right there, five books, right? To dwell on the land which the Lord swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to them. If we do this, there will be no war. There will be no hostages, no corrupt governments, no false rabbis, no hunger, no poverty, only peace. So let this be a warning to us all in our personal lives and as a nation. Hopefully we can come together as a nation because when we are at peace, nothing can touch us. If we allow even one person who carries bad intent in, we will all be paying for it as we have been, as we are to this very day from an event that happened almost 3,500 years ago, the golden calf, right? More like... 3,300 and change. Anyway, that's our class for today. Please stay tuned for the next week's class. We continue with the golden calf and see exactly what or who got into it. So as always, thank you for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Have a Shabbat Shalom. And I'm Israel Chai, guys. See you. Bye-bye.